Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you for introducing Child Care to the Hackathon, which is a great, uh, great thing. And um, so I'm going to present here a project that just started, and I'm really excited about this project, and it's about detecting a structure of variants which results to be lethal in humans. And uh, so I do work at the National Art Research Council in Italy in Naples. Um, all right, so, um, so actually, uh, despite what you, you might think, like a bird is a lottery because actually most of the conceptions uh, fail to achieve viability. That means that, um, you know, about 70% to what depends on, there are like um, kind of confusing data in literature because it depends on how this has been uh, verified and also it's not easy to verify conceptions, but anyway. Um, and 50% of those 70% uh, fail before uh, a person can realize actually that a conception has actually happened. And, and, um, and what's even worse is that there are many cases, and actually uh, I was uh, surprised to understand that it's pretty common, uh, like one in 300 uh, a person has experienced like a, a, a recurrent pregnancy loss that means at least two in a row. And even here, there's like a, a broad range of definition in literature because this is a, a still um, a not fully explored field. And so the diagnosis of uh, recurrent pregnancy losses is done uh, by checking uh, those kind of factors like um, endocrine conditions or autoimmune disease or if there are some like um, uh, anatomic like uh, failures or major problems. And sometimes also through uh, screenings of genetic factors, but mostly by ascertaining like single genes, like mutations in single genes, uh, which are known to be, uh, you know, uh, major, uh, major responsible for, uh, for, uh, for miscarriages. Um, however, um, some, this is really hard to use. <laughs> okay, however, there's a fraction of uh, uh, RPL which is undiagnosed, and also uh, what is like more um, interesting is that 75, 70, 75% uh, of people can uh, can have like a, uh, there's a 70, 75 percent probability of a live birth after a recurrent pregnancy loss, and so that means that there are like uh, genetic factors. Uh, underlying. Uh, so what is missed today, what is missed so far is like a, a, a systematic study of small sites sequence variants because what normally people do is to ascertain for large chromosomal abnormalities uh, but you'd be surprised there are very few studies investigating small, um, uh, systematically investigating small variants and what we want to target is a uh, both highly deleterious dominant mutations, which give rise to sporadic events, and also uh, moderately to high deleterious recessive mutations, which are part of the genetic loads of the human populations. Um, so this is the project I'm doing, and it's called uh, Deciphering a Genetic Cause of Recurrent Pregnancy Losses. And it's a pilot project in collaboration with the Wakensange Institute, and it's funded by a private company and partially by Envo. And so the data set we have is a, is a fetal DNA extracted from chorionic villi of miscarriages. And we also have a collection of inducent abortion. Uh, so the uh, chorionic villi are the, uh, like the outermost layer of the embryo. This would be the embryo, this is the umbilical cord, and this is the placenta. So the chorionic villi is the, uh, is the uh, outermost layer of the embryo. And um, so we use the uh, we use the induced miscarriages data as a control to um, exclude comorbidities. The, in this case, this is the monarch age, and as you see in the miscarriages, the monarch age is a wide range. So we simply exclude um, the uh, uh, cases in which uh, the monarch age is different from induced abortion. And that's to uh, remove uh, effect of like comorbidities. And the very first results we had is that uh, we explored a collection of like about 50, uh, we, we started exploring 50, 50, 60 samples. And vast majority of these got excluded for comorbidities. And then a fraction has been screened, has been excluded because after screening with the QF-PCR or with the ACGH, they have 
large chromosomal abnormalities. And the very first results we got so far is that only 7% of the samples we collect goes to sequencing. And that means like, you know, that we need to collect a lot of samples. And that's why uh, we intend to scale the project. Um, so what we need to do is to uh, develop tools for uh, two main uh, tasks. And the first one is the integration of the samples. As I said, we're going to scale the project by um, collecting samples in a collaboration with the Monash University of Malaysia, and so and also other so uh, and also other like institutions. So we want to this data to be integrated and interconnected, and also. Uh, uh, the most important part is also like the uh, screening after sequencing, and we have to develop tools for um, for choosing among all the possible variants, which are the one which really matters. And this could be either uh, by focusing, you know, those are just few points. We for sure will focus on rare variants, and we want to uh, we want to incorporate the information standing variation that already exists, and also uh, you know a bunch of other things like. Uh, taking into account regions of homozygosity or autozygosity and also taking into account uh, prediction of functional consequences of arts. And so this is, this is it pretty much, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about this project I just started. Thank you.